God and politics. No one is fanning the flames more than Donald Trump and his MAGA army. From the Easter attacks on trans visibility to questioning President Joe Biden's Christianity and faith to hawking his own version of the Bible, it is a political holy war. And I want to welcome two people who are well versed in the subject. One of them is Texas State Representative James Tallarico, a rising star in the Democratic Party. He's also a Christian, an outspoken progressive, and he has made a habit of calling out those he sees as perverting his faith in order to attack democracy. I say this to you as a fellow Christian, Representative Obama, I know you're a devout Christian as, and so am I. This bill to me is not only unconstitutional, it's not only un-American, I think it is also deeply unchristian. And I say that because I believe this bill is idolatrous, I believe it is exclusionary, and I believe it is arrogant. And those three things in my reading of the gospel are diametrically opposed to the teachings of Jesus. You probably know Matthew 6, 5, when Jesus says, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners. When you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. A religion that has to force people to put up a poster to prove its legitimacy is a dead religion. Kurt Bardella is also here. He's a former spokesperson and senior advisor for the Republicans on the House Oversight Committee. But he left the party back in 2017 in disgust, and he has since served as an advisor for the Democratic National Committee. For some time now, he has been warning everyone about the far right's embrace of Christian nationalism and a plot called Project 2025. Representative and Kurt, thank you so much for joining us, gentlemen. Well, we really appreciate us. it. Uh, Representative, I'm going to start with you because I want to know, how does it feel as a devout Christian when you see someone like the former president, President Trump, selling Bibles to help pay for his legal bills? Yeah, you know, Donald Trump was spending Holy Week peddling these Trump Bibles so that he could raise enough money to pay these jury awarded damages to a woman that he was found guilty of sexually assaulting. And it's ironic because on Holy Week is when Jesus stormed into the temple, into the seat of religious and political power and flipped over the tables of the money changers, those who were profiting off people's religious beliefs, those who were exploiting people of faith. And so I think if Jesus were here today, he would tell Donald Trump the same thing he told the money changers, which is that you have turned my house of prayer into a den of thieves. Yeah, but listen, he certainly has a hold on the evangelical party. I mean, they, they still, uh, lots of strong uh, support for him. Their, the vote remains high among him, um, with him, uh, among his strongest supporters. I wonder why is he, and correct me if I'm wrong in how I'm phrasing, how I'm um, framing this, why is he so good at really capitalizing on the Christian, weaponizing really the Christian right? Well, you know, I, I think my party should take some responsibility for that. And I think it's because we have neglected uh, to speak to people of faith in this country. The Democratic Party used to feel comfortable using religious and moral language, and not just exclusively Christian language, but uh, a moral vocabulary from all kinds of faith traditions. And we have we stopped doing that. And, and I think we've allowed demagogues like Donald Trump to fill the vacuum. Are you shocked that, and Kurt, you can jump in, I'm going to ask you about the media coverage, but let me just ask you one more question, our representative. Are you shocked because people are giving him money? Why are they doing it? Well, you know, I think people um, are susceptible to demagogues like Donald Trump who manipulate and, uh, and exploit their, their fears uh, and their anxieties. And I think that's what you're seeing now with these, these Trump Bibles and, and with evangelical Christians flocking to Donald Trump. It's, it's on all of us, whether you're a progressive Democrat like me um, or just a concerned citizen, to, to reach out to these folks and make sure they know they have a, a home in, in our party and, and they should join our fight to save American democracy. Kurt, that may be hard to do. I think it is hard to do when you have a whole ecosystem of conservative media, which you appear on a lot, uh, who amplify you know, this sort of Christian right, conservative, nationalist, uh, message. 
throughout the day on and on and on as, as they did during mm -hmm. Easter and this whole trans movement, which we'll talk about later, but that may be tough to do. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we have now. If this were 20 years ago, I think it would be a lot easier to combat a lot of what we're seeing right now, how Trump has successfully used these media ecosystems to deliver his message, his propaganda, his talking points, his snake oil salesman routine directly to the, we live in a world now where people get to choose what ecosystem they want to stand and they never have to get outside of it. It's a bubble of their own making now. And they are self-served every single day of bombardment of content, telling them, validating them that you are right, that this is the way this guy is, is, is the leader, the one that you should follow. Uh, and there's no mechanism to really cut through the color. Part of the reason I get asked this all the time, why do I appear on some of these places? It's because you cannot beat something with nothing. If you don't take the message to them, if you don't meet people where they are, you're never going to reach them. You're never going to change mind. That's one of the real failings. And the representative is 1,000% right of the Democratic Party to completely abandon the field and just surrender it to these MAGA extremists who have been all too happy to just pick up where the Democrats abandon and just feed them constantly. If you don't give people an option, a choice, they're going to just stay where they are. So you, then there's no responsibility for the actual people, especially for the people in the party because uh, are actual Christians, because they read the Bible. They know what religion is all about. They know Donald Trump's history. And yet and still they continue to support him and to give him money and well, to and, and that's promote why, him. You know, you know, if if you him. are a self-professed Christian, if you are a self-professed person of faith, but you are supporting Donald Trump, I can't think of anything more the antithesis of being Christ-like than lining up behind Donald Trump. And the excuse that these people use time and time again is, well, we don't like him, but we agree with his policies. Well, it's good for the pocketbook. You know, we look past the other stuff. And it, I can't, it, it is the starkest example of hypocrisy I think I have ever seen. And, and the representative sees this, especially in places like Texas, where there are these big faith mega churches of people uh, who congregate every Sunday, have these palaces, these cathedrals that they have built for themselves that, that they go through uh, the enriching of the community that they serve. And they all sit there and they nod their heads along and, and vote for Donald Trump. Uh, you know, and, and it's just the, the complete opposite of what faith is supposed to be about. Selling a Bible with your name on I can't think of anything more appalling than someone like Jesus Christ than someone doing that. Absolutely. Blasphemous. Am I wrong? Am I wrong, Representative? I mean, you're going to the Divinity School. Is that is that blasphemous for Donald Trump to do that? Absolutely. You know, um, many folks who are watching know the story of Jesus being tempted by the devil out in the wilderness. And one of the things the devil offered was political power, all the kingdoms of the world, and Jesus rejected it. So for Christians to be courting political power, it is idolatrous and, and certainly blasphemous. And, and I hope we can return to the roots of our faith, return to scripture, and remember what Christianity is all about. I, I want to also, um, Evangelical Christians would get really upset if someone, I'm sure they'll get really upset if they saw something like this, but if someone uh, challenged or questioned their faith. And Kurt, they have been questioning the faith of, of President Biden, especially recently for Easter when you had Transgender uh, Awareness Day. And speaking of the media, conservative media, I mean, they went crazy with this. People can feel how they want to feel. I should say people have questions about, um, about transgenderism and so on. And some of those are legitimate questions. But for them to amplify it this way for such a small minority of people, a statement from the White House basically saying that all people are created equal. What do you make of, of this whole, you know, thing that that people that the right wing media has done uh, and conservative evangelical Christians about this transgender awareness day and questioning the current? Well, to me, it faith. signals how insecure in their faith they actually are. Is your faith so weak, so meek? built on something so unstable that the mere acknowledgement that all people are equal and should be treated as such is a threat to your religion, is a threat to your community, is a threat to your value system. Uh, again, saying people are equal and should be treated kindly and with fairness and with compassion and with openness, I can't think of a more appropriate message during a holy week like Easter than a message like that from the president of the United States. And oh, by the way, <laughs> let's dispel this myth that somehow Joe Biden was replacing Easter with this day. This day has been this day for years. Even during the Trump administration, March 31st was Transgender Awareness Day. Guess what? In seven years, if anyone knows how a calendar works, 
Transgender Awareness Day will fall on Easter Sunday in exactly seven years. Save the date, folks. This is not new. It's because exactly. of the lunar calendar. It's I mean, because it's, of the lunar it's calendar, absurd right? that, that, that they made the this a thing, and, and it's just gaslighting. As, as a Christian, how do you feel about this representative? I mean, again, um, you don't have to agree with someone's, you know, however they identify or what have you. As a Christian, you can, have, you can feel a certain way about it. But to get so upset about someone saying the president and the White House and the administration saying all people are created equal and should be treated fairly in society, is that so wrong? Well, you know, uh, President Biden is objectively one of the most um, devoutly religious presidents that we've had in modern American history. Just, you know, regardless of, of whether or not you agree with his politics, he attends regular church services, often quotes by memory scripture and, and, and Christian hymns, uh, and is obviously moved deeply by, by his faith. And you're exactly right. You know, Easter changes dates. Um, and March 31st is always uh, Transgender Visibility Day. Uh, and sometimes, you know, Easter also falls on Mother's Day. And, and to me, I think it's appropriate to spend a few minutes on the day that we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, the day we celebrate the triumph of love over violence, the triumph of life over death, to recognize our moms who gave us both love and life, and to recognize trans children who deserve both. So to me, this is, this is an appropriate um, uh, overlap of these two, these two days of recognition. Hmm. Um, Kurt, I wanna move on and talk about this because we are talking about what, what is being proposed for the agenda for the next Trump administration if he happens to uh, be reelected. Uh, it's Project 2025, it's a policy proposed Proposal intended to lay out a plan for Trump's second term. Stephen Miller, Mark Meadows, uh, Charlie Kirk all have contributed to Project 2025. Many of his suggested policies are overtly Christian nationalist, Kurt. Uh, having known many of these people, because you work with Kirk Van and you work with a lot of these folks for years, um, are you surprised at all that this extreme list of policy about these policy suggestions? No, I mean, the only all? reason why this wasn't the working uh, document back in 2016 is because no one thought he was going to actually win, including those closest to him, like Steve Bannon. Uh, they, they, they didn't think Trump was going to win. If they had any inclination that that was going to be realistic, they would have started Project 2025. It would have been Project 2016, I guarantee you. Um, <clears throat> they have been telling us the entire time exactly the portrait of America that they want to inject and install and then thrust upon all of us. Uh, you know, Steve Bannon has all, has said openly, he's a, a self-proclaimed Leninist, that his goal is to tear down all of the structures of the so-called establishment, all the structures and pillars that have kept our country going. So of course they want to undermine that and replace it with this radicalized warped version of what, you know, some would call theology, I suppose. Uh, it's anything but that. But it's really about submission. It's about imposing an extreme Christian, radical, evangelical viewpoint on the rest of us. As a devout Christian representative, how do you feel about policies like this? Well, I think we can all acknowledge that uh, Donald Trump is not religious. You know, I, I doubt he's ever um, opened a Bible, including the ones that he's he's selling. But I'm glad is... you mentioned that. I forgot to ask you that question when I talked about the Bible. Do you actually think Donald <laughs> Trump has actually read a Bible? But go well, on. Well, I think from what I from what I understand, these Trump Bibles have both um, uh, the the U.S. Constitution and the Bible in in one book. And I think the only thing those two things have in common is that Donald Trump has has neglected to read either. <laughs> but you know, I, I would say that. I would say that um, you know when it comes to to this next um, this next Trump campaign and the possible second Trump administration, that he is surrounded by religious extremists. So although he may not be religious himself, he enables um, these Christian nationalists, and he's he's kind of their useful idiot. You know, as long as they give him political power, he gives them their policies, just like he did when he overturned. Roe v. Wade. And so a lot of the folks, including the guy who's rumored to be his next chief of staff in a second Trump administration, are self-proclaimed Christian nationalists. And they are already planning on banning abortion nationwide, banning contraception, banning IVF, banning gay marriage. And so make no mistake, a vote for Donald Trump is a vote for Christian nationalism. Uh, Kurt, it has been reported by the Washington Post that one policy under consideration is Trump using the Insurrection Act 
of 1807 to activate the military for domestic law enforcement, as well as directing the DOJ to target Trump adversaries. I mean, Kurt, do you believe that this is actually Absolutely. something that they would go Absolutely. through? Everybody needs to do? understand something. January 6th is the starting point of Trump too. That is their starting point. And what January 6th was really about was about silencing and suppressing the will of the people and eliminating their right to participate in the democratic process. We saw with how Trump acted during the Black Lives Matter protests and Black, what is now Black Lives Matter Plaza here in DC, uh, that, that he was all too happy to unleash as much force as possible to disrupt a peaceful congregation of people rightly protesting uh, you know, some of the abuses we've seen with law enforcement in America. Uh, I have no doubt that they have these grand designs to try to si silence and suppress the opposition of any kind. They, they will not have any tolerance for anyone exercising their First Amendment right, uh, further proof, by the way, as Representative pointed out that Trump has never read the Constitution, uh, that we have this right to assemble and to express our values and our beliefs. And we have a responsibility, a civic responsibility, to protest the policies of the government that are oppressive, that are a violation of the Constitution. That is what they are going to try to do. And they tell us that every single day. They tell us that when they say the people that were behind January 6th are somehow political prisoners or hostages and are patriots and should be celebrated. They're telling us what they're going to do when they do that. Did you want to weigh in, Representative? I thought you wanted to get in before I asked the, uh, the, you know, the next question. What do you... What do you... Well, you know, something I hope that believers and, and Christians understand is that our faith naturally leads to democracy. You know, the, a lot of um, our Christian tradition has influenced the project of democracy, including here in America, the idea that every single human being is created in the image of God and is created equal. That is a fundamental Christian idea. And so I, I personally believe that the closest thing we have to the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is a true multiracial, multicultural democracy, something that has yet to exist in this country or or anywhere in human history. Mm -hmm. Listen, I, I, this it's surprising, and I want the viewers to to hear this because um, this Project Twenty Twenty Five also proposes a number of sweeping changes, including dismantling the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Education and the Department of Commerce. You talked a little bit about this, Kurt. It also includes banning abortion pills, pornography nationwide. It's also been reported by the Washington Post that one policy under consideration, gentlemen, was Trump using the Insurrection Act to, to as I said, activate the military for domestic law enforcement and directing the DOJ to target Trump adversaries. Yeah. That is I mean, right. they will use the instruments of government to attack and police and arrest and hold anyone that they view as the opposition. They will not talk. I mean, Trump openly muses about doing that, saying it's so unfair that he is scrutinized for his alleged crimes. Uh, and, and they have that, well, just wait till we have the reins of power. We're going to do that times 50 to all of you. Um, you know, it, I mean, it is a very dangerous and dystopian view of, of what America could look like under Donald Trump. Well, co Congressman, what are, you, what are Democrats doing? What are you guys doing in Washington about this? <laughs> well, you know, I, I think it's incumbent upon Democrats in particular to articulate to voters exactly what the stakes are. We have been warned about what a second Trump administration would look like. We were warned on January 6th, 2021, um, what's coming if Trump regains power. And if if we allow that to happen, uh, we are deliberately putting our democracy, our constitution- Can we also just acknowledge the hilarity here of banning pornography from the guy who had an affair with the porn star? <laughs> I'm just gonna let that sit for a minute there. <laughs> okay, so it is sad for a minute. Let, let's, let's move on and talk about uh, the election. Uh, because, Kurt, you, Donald Trump did not want to, the former President Trump did not want to debate any of the Republican rivals or hopefuls uh, in this race. But now he is champing at the bit to debate Joe Biden. What's well, I think that the mean? Trump people believe that, well, first of all, that they didn't need to do the primary debates because Trump was going to win and no one was going to lay a glove on him. And frankly, they were right about that. Uh, like, I can't fault them for having a winning yeah. strategy there. Uh, I think that they believe that. Uh, I, I remember watching you. I have to say, pardon my interruption here. I remember watching you, and they were going through, you know, Nikki Haley and all of the other folks, and I, you know, you were just like, okay, this is all fun and games to watch. 
but the nominee is going to be Donald Trump. And right as I was watching, I was like, "Yes, Kurt, you're right." Sorry, to interrupt. Uh, so uh, you know, I think that I think that they really believe and they buy into almost their own propaganda that that Joe Biden uh, can't hold his own in the debate, that he's too old to debate, that Trump will run circles around him. Uh, and, and I think that the president showed, frankly, with his State of the Union performance, that he's more than up to the task. There's a question of what is there to gain by debating Trump? Are you legitimizing someone by st- sharing a stage with the guy who still to this day won't acknowledge you won the last election? Uh, part of me says, yeah, Biden should agree to debate on right. the, the condition that the very first question needs to be who won the 2020 election, who's the rightful president. And if Donald Trump doesn't say President Biden, Biden should just walk off the stage right there and call it a day. You think so? Do you you think so? Yeah. Do you agree with that, Representative? You know, I think President Biden should welcome the opportunity to share his record with the American people. Uh, Things are not perfect in this country. We've got a lot of work still left to do. But President Biden has been the most successful president in modern American history, certainly in my lifetime. I mean, if you look at his record of achievement on bringing back manufacturing to this country, on combating climate change, on bringing down inflation, on cutting child poverty in half. I mean, these are remarkable accomplishments, particularly in a in a polarized era that is marked by by legislative gridlock. And so I I think we should be anxious to to share this record with the American people and expose Donald Trump for what he is, which is an authoritarian and a grifter. I I, listen, I agree. The the economy, we have the best economy in the world. Um, Actually, things are looking up uh, in America. Uh, regardless of you know what you see, listen, there are random acts of violence that happen all the time, but crime yep. overall is down in America. You would not know that if you watched or read certain conservative uh, news sites or people who, you know, the, the president's opponents. I, I'm just wondering why is it so hard for that to sink in with the American people? And is that, does the Biden administration, is there any onus on them or is there any onus on Democrats? for not being able to get that message across. Yes, you know, it is on us to make that argument to the American people. And if we don't, we're to blame. And so that's why I think it's important that we take every opportunity we can to clearly articulate to the American people what President Biden has done and what Donald Trump did as president. We saw a historic spike in violent crime when Donald Trump was president. And now we've seen a historic decline under President Biden. So, so the record is very. Wait, say clear. that again, please, so people can know again. Because you don't no, hear this that message, you hear the yeah. flip of that. Say it again. Right under Donald Trump, when Donald Trump was president, we saw a historic spike in violent crime, and now under President Biden, we have seen an equally historic decline in violent crime. So the the record here is is crystal clear, and I'm confident that once we uh, articulate this message for the American people. They're going to make the right decision at the ballot box for this country. Kurt, you want yeah, to weigh in you know, on that? Again, I think that um, part of the challenge for Democrats, and, I, and I've been one of the most vocal critics about how Democrats at times fumble the messaging, uh, how I wish they attacked things more like Republicans when it comes to messaging. But the one thing that and I, you say they because you well, are I'm a Democrat, Democrat now, but I come at it as a former Republican. And so I have a different type of okay. mentality as Republicans do when it comes to messaging. Republicans are. You're a Republican. Exactly. I love that. Uh, <laughs> the one challenge that Democrats have that isn't their fault is that we live in a media ecosystem that is constantly falling into the trap of trying to appease their enemies at the expense of their friends. We saw it recently with my former home place of MSNBC uh, hiring Ronnie McDaniel uh, and how that backfired spectacularly. I remember uh, back at your former stomping grounds at CNN. Uh, when there was this effort to reach out more to Republicans when Chris Lick took over. And I, and I wrote a column for the LA Times that got under Chris's skin, apparently, uh, saying, like, this is a fool's errand because these people are never going to be on your side. They're never going to say, oh, you guys are giving us a fair shot. They're always going to use the excuse, it's working the referees, that the media ecosystem is against them, the establishment media, the New York liberals, the LA liberals, uh, you know, it, it's all against us. Therefore, we need the Fox Newses and the Newsmaxes and the OANNs and all of that. And so Democrats are constantly having to deal with a, with a situation where there are those who are in power in major networks who say, oh, we should give an opportunity to some of these other people to show that we're not biased when they're only just disingenuous gaslighters who will lie to their audience. Well, what I've, I think I wrote something that said um, 
you know, Jane and Joe six pack or whatever, a Republican, they're not going to think that MSNBC is any less liberal because they hired yes. Lana McDaniel. I mean, it's, right. it's, that, that is, it's a fool's errand. But I digress. Let's let's talk about the you know this threat of this project twenty twenty five looming. Um, just the other day, other day, the Wall Street Journal showed this is a poll, the latest poll, that Trump still has a lead over Joe Biden, President Biden, six of the seven major in six of the seven major swing states. So this is for both of you. How can Biden make up that ground with voters, Representative? Yeah, you know, I think we we got to simultaneously take these polls seriously where the president is obviously um, behind, not by a lot, but but behind uh, as, as the race stands today. But we should also acknowledge that it's really early in the cycle and that a lot of undecided voters, a lot of swing voters haven't quite tuned in to to this election. Um, and so that means we have an opportunity to, to convey the message of what Joe Biden has done for this country and what Donald Trump did to this country during his four years. And I think once we do that, uh, and if we are disciplined in our messaging, if we're aggressive in our campaigning, then I think we can close that gap. And I think ultimately Joe Biden can prevail on Election Day in November. Kurt, I want to talk to you about issues, because what is it? Usually it's the economy, stupid, right? Is it the economy? Is it a woman's right, meaning abortion? Is it the war in Gaza? What issues do the president need to tackle if he wants to turn this polling around and the well, messaging I think around? First, I think everyone should understand that I don't believe between now and November that neither Joe Biden or Donald Trump will ever have a lead larger than the error of margin in any of the polls that we're going to see. Uh, these are two of the most well-known political figures in American history at this point. Everybody knows how they feel about Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Uh, there's no new ground to cover there. What I do know is that ever since Roe was overturned, we have seen in every kind of election, whether it's a midterm election, whether it's special elections, whether it's state elections, whether it's uh, state representative districts in red and blue states, Democrats overperform, Republicans underperform, Democrats winning with women, suburban women, Republicans losing with them. And Republicans have chosen ever since then to get even more extreme on their positions. It wasn't enough to take away women's right to choose. Now they're going after IVF. Now they're going after a national abortion ban. Now they're going after your right to make a decision between you and your doctor. And if the doctor doesn't do what we think he should do, we might throw him in jail. If you go to another state, take the medical procedure you need, you might go to jail. That's the message of the Republican Party. And every time they keep doubling, tripling down on that, they lose. So I think that when you look at the largest constituency of voters that we have in this country, it's women. I don't care what any poll says. We have seen in every election just the other week in Alabama in a, in a state uh, in a state house seat that was plus seven Republican. It flipped over to Democrat. We are seeing mm -hmm. that happen all over the place. Abortion, women's rights, women's right to choose. That matters more to the everyday American than the things that Republicans complain about. Well, okay. listen, I'm glad you mentioned that because also we know what's happened in Florida, Representative. In recent days, Florida's announced that they're going to hold a statewide referendum uh, on abortion just after the Supreme Court upheld a six-week ban on that issue. Uh, 21 other states have limited or banned abortions. In recent polling, as many as one in eight voters say abortion is the most important issue. One in five women say it is the most important issue. I asked, I'm going to ask you a very similar question. What is the issue or what are the issues that the president um, needs to bring to the fore in order to make a difference? Yeah, you know, I personally think that this 2024 election is about freedom, whether it's the freedom to to uh, to choose, whether it's the freedom to read, the freedom to travel, the freedom to marry. Um, this is what is at stake in, in November. And I, I live in a state where we have banned abortion, including in cases of rape and incest. In fact, since that abortion ban went into place here in Texas, 26,000 Texas women have been forced to give birth to their rapist babies. And so I, I know full well the consequences of these extreme Christian nationalist policies that Donald Trump enables and supports. And, and I refuse to let that happen to the rest of my country. And so I hope President Biden, when he's hitting the campaign trail, will focus on freedom and, and our, our obligation to protect that in this country. Gentlemen, I really appreciate you joining us. Kurt, I hope you don't have a cold in case you heard some coughing. I'm recovering from studio. bronchitis. I have a, a senior. 
Oh my gosh, I'm sorry about that. Well, I have a sick pup who is also has a similar thing. He's a senior dog and he's in the, I brought him in the studio because I, you know, we only have so much time with him. So you probably heard him coughing in the background. Yeah. So thank you both gentlemen. Be well. I appreciate you joining us and I hope to see you real soon on Thanks the Godline Show. And thank you for watching everyone. And remember, the conversation doesn't end just because the camera stopped rolling. I'll see you next time on The Don Lemon Show. Thanks for watching The Don Lemon Show. Make sure you click on the image in the top right to subscribe to my channel and the thumbnail in the bottom right to watch more content from my show. And I'll see you next time.